Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. One and one, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of the mission, we do these free mentoring roundtables every week. This is the 527th session we've done. We've had over 150,000 people participate. It's, a, it's been going on since the fall of 2008. And, uh, has become a fixture in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. All recordings are available on our YouTube channel, 1 and 1 and Roundtable. And on Twitter, uh, you will find us at 1 and by 1 and at Romana. Today's hashtag is 1 and 1 and. These are the call in numbers. We have some scheduled programming first, and then we will go to call in. You know, I got the second Moderna shot uh, vaccine yesterday. And um, I feel a little bit under the weather, so I'll do my best, but um, please bear with me. We are going to start today's session with Michael Smertlow, co-founder and managing director of Next Coast Ventures. Michael, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. It's funny, I, I got my second shot yesterday, so you and I will, will power through this together. <laughs> Do you have any reactions? Very sore arm so far. So hopefully that's it, but we'll see. It was only, it's less than 24 hours in. Yeah, I have very sore arm. Last night I had some discomfort. A friend of mine who got it two days ago had terrible reactions. So she was like, oh, you're going to get reactions in 10 to 15 hours. Well, thankfully so far I haven't got big reactions. Yeah, you and I can send, uh, send each other some positive vibes that it's uh, mild, yes. yeah. Good. <laughs> All right, Michael, let's catch up. Uh, how have you been through COVID and, and how's the firm? How are your portfolio companies? Tell us a little bit. Yeah, well, it's a fascinating time, right? Um, I think we're all now starting to figure out what the new normal looks like, but candidly, it's uh, it's been an interesting tale of two cities from the global pandemic, obviously tragedy and a lot of hardship. I think it's, I, I jokingly say, I don't think, not jokingly, I don't think it's ever been a harder time to be an entrepreneur. It's always hard but throw in running a business and then global pandemic, social unrest, political unrest. Um, but for us as a firm, I'd say it's been pretty good in that we invest on long-term themes. A lot of the themes that we had invested in over the last five years got accelerated by COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And we think a lot of them are, are going to continue to accelerate some of the innovation that we invested behind. So it's a it tale of two cities in that Obviously, a pandemic has brought a whole sorts of um, physical and emotional challenges for everybody. But in the flip side, from an innovation perspective, it's accelerated a lot of themes that we have invested behind. So let's uh, double click down on those themes. What are the themes that you have invested in that have accelerated in COVID? Yeah, so we started the firm, uh, myself and a gentleman named Tom Ball in Austin about five years ago. And we wanted to be thematic. And so some of the themes we spent time on and, and invested behind were the future of work. The future of retail, uh, software, what we called software 3.0, which is just the continual evolution of, of enterprise SaaS and, and how that's changed. I know you've written a lot about that, but really, I would say the first two in particular, future of work and future of retail were themes. And actually, I'm sorry, also, we did uh, some things around personal health care. So those three really accelerated. And I believe a lot of the trends and changes in human behavior that happened with COVID we think are longstanding. We don't think they're temporary. Uh, we've spent a lot yeah. of time, we've spent a lot of time thinking about, and I wrote a blog post this about uh, what stays, like what are the things that are temporary? And I put in that category, travel, uh, going to sporting events or live events or music. As soon as we get vaccination, I think humans go back to what they were doing before. There's the other end of the spectrum of things that I don't think ever go back. And that might be going to see a doctor, telemedicine, I think uh, how organizations are managed, don't go back. And then there's some that are in the middle. Unfortunately, some of our early themes were in that, you know, don't go back category. So what are some of the companies that you've invested in, in the themes that are uh, accelerating and what's been their journey? Give us a few examples. Yeah, and so one example in the, uh, okay. sorry, in, the, in the healthcare side, we invested, five years ago or four years ago in a company called Everlywell in Austin, Texas, which does direct to consumer uh, lab testing is where it started off. 
And so it was really helping consumers with the massively frustrating situation. Go see doctor, doctor tells you to go get lab tests, go to lab, get some purple paper with results that your doctor doesn't really interpret for you. And you're left with a frustrating experience. Everly well disrupted that whole supply chain and went direct to consumer with, I think, over 30 different tests, food sensitivity, testosterone, uh, even STDs. And the business has done incredibly well pre-COVID. And then when you move forward with COVID, they were the first uh, company to do an FDA-approved COVID test at home. And what that mm -hmm. did was not only did they see an acceleration from their business from COVID, but they also have, we've seen a, a pretty radical change in consumer behavior meaning there's this big chunk of consumers that hadn't really done a lab test at home, were forced to due to COVID, and then started to experience, well, wow, what else could I do? Uh, so that business mm -hmm. has done incredibly well and was recently valued at close to $2 billion, which is uh, really wonderful and I think has a long way to go. Great. Congratulations. Yeah, we did another, another company we did also in Austin was a company called Alert Media. This was really around duty of care and employee safety. Um, and that company really helped with once COVID started to really uh, come online and people started thinking about how do I manage, and I think all executives were faced with this, how do I manage a wildly different employee base? My employees aren't all in one location. They're now working from home. They have different physical and, and in IT security needs. How do I manage that? And Alert helps companies with that aspect of it. And it also seen a massive acceleration pre and now post COVID. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what are you thinking looking ahead? Um, just a bit of catching up on your fan, fund situation. What fund are you investing from? What is the size of the fund? What kind of check sizes are you writing? What stage are you coming into? And what would be the focus going forward? Yeah, so Next Coast Ventures has raised two funds. Our first one was 90 million. Our second one was 130 million. We're about two thirds of the way through the second fund, but still actively investing out of it. Our typical check size ranges between five and $10 million. We like to focus on series A and series B companies. And we tend to invest, or we only invest outside of the coast because all of those metrics I just talked about check size, uh, they don't work in the kind of the mega rounds that are happening outside of, uh, on the, in the Valley or on the coast. So we're, we're much more aligned with the way you think about the world is how do entrepreneurs own, continue to own a big chunk of their business, be capital efficient and drive real outcomes, which I, I think a lot of things you talk about. So that's our average, that's where we play. In terms of our investment philosophy, we focus again on these themes. They're all listed on our website under nextcoastventures.com. Uh, it is future of retail, future of work, software 3.0, still some healthcare thesis around it, but they're all published on our website. Uh, and what we do is we look for, we publish those themes out in the world we look to activate our network and also look for entrepreneurs to understand what we do and what we don't do. And then we look to work with the very best entrepreneurs building great businesses outside the coast, try and roll up our sleeves and, uh, and help them with what we call company building. Take board seats are actively oh. involved and really try and help them. Mike, I will tell you one thing though, that you may want to kind of take note of is that there are on the coast also the kinds of ventures that you're looking for that are capital efficient ventures run by people who don't want to play the unicorn game of you know flushing companies with capital and this what what's come to be known as blip scaling with capital and and you know so the philosophy that we espouse is being practiced on the coasts as well yeah and I, I it's it's great that you call that out and i'd worked in silicon valley for 18 years, I ran, I was part of an operating team and ran a company there. So know the Valley really well. And I think I, I should have said, it's more of a mentality. The next coast ventures yeah, idea is mentality. more of a mentality than a, than a geographic limitation. That is correct. That is correct. And geographically, are you uh, constraining yourself to the U S only, or are you global now? We do focus the bulk of our, uh, or all of our capital in the U S and it's largely because of not real any limitation other than. We like to be active in the, in the company. We like to really try and help on the ground, if you will. And we feel mm -hmm. like our quote unquote swim lane is best done where we can help locally. That may change over time, but right now with a relatively small fund, that's how we think about our opportunity set. There's a very large number of entrepreneurs who are starting elsewhere and coming into the US 
uh, after they get their pieces validated, get some customers, get the product built and so forth. And we see a lot of that flow just because of who we are. Yeah, that's that's wildly interesting to us. It's just a matter of our, you know, again, we, we are, a, I think we're up to about 15 investment professionals now. So we continue to grow. It's grown since the last time you and I spoke, but we really believe our key attributes are helping entrepreneurs in a robust way. And so trying to make sure our scope um, is is resonant with what the entrepreneur is trying to do is our, our key focus. And what are the geographies where those 15 partners that you're talking about are, um, you know, located, have physical presence? Well, our headquarters are in Austin, Texas, so the bulk of the firm is in Austin. Um, we haven't announced it yet, but you are expanding into another Nexco's market, so that'll come out here in a couple of weeks. But the bulk of our investment professionals sit in Austin, Texas, but we also know that in this world, and I think this is a post-COVID uh, phenomenon, people, you can do this job from anywhere. You can invest in companies anywhere, again, within that U.S. geography. So we just try and uh, have some center of gravity around Austin. That's where our firm is and where our physical presence is. Yeah. Um, there is a big uptick also, as I'm sure you're seeing in virtual companies. People are building, people are hiring wherever at the moment, and yep. uh, and that's that's definitely a trend we are seeing quite a bit. Okay, so um, talk a bit about what do you think COVID is doing to us besides what we've talked about, the future of work and so forth. Um, what other opportunities are emerging because of what we have just gone through this reset that we are still going through actually? Um, what else is, should we pay attention to? Well, yeah, it, it's it, my personal take is, and it's been a, a, a human experiment on a global scale, right? Something that's in largely unprecedented, which I think to your point, will the long tail will be interesting to see it plays out. I have an assertion that I think we may look back at 2020 as a massive pivotal year for entrepreneurship. This is Mike's view. I think we were forced, and again, not, not putting aside or, or dismissing all the personal challenges and, and obviously the health crisis and, and the unfortunate pandemic. But having said that, I think it unlocked more entrepreneurship than perhaps we even recognize. And it might be one of those years when we look back uh, 10 years from now and say, put a big circle around 2020, 2021 and say, innovation happened at a pace and a scale that we really didn't fully appreciate. And I mean that because just about every business was forced almost overnight to think about digital, digital transformation. There were a bunch of human patterns that I mentioned earlier that we did and overnight we had to think differently about. Uh, and then we had a bunch of, I think, preconceived notions that where we thought, yeah, you can only do it this way. Everyone has to be in the headquarters. You can never build a remote company. Uh, you know, if I want to go out to eat, I have to drive to the restaurant and sit down, right? Simple things like that, that all got thrown into the proverbial blender. And I think entrepreneurship is going to emerge in this. And we're going to say, holy cow, 2021 was uh, a massive time for innovation. And that's, that's what gets me super excited. Uh, and again, no. not dismissing all the, the personal and, tra and physical challenges that, that the year brought on. There are, um, I would say, three trends that are, um, that I think have accelerated. Uh, people are at home, right? They're working from home and, and the whole social life has gone out of the window. So there's more family time when you have the right conditions and so forth. But people have also had a lot more time to think. And um, and I think one one of the phenomena out of this is people have started, uh, you know, tinkering with doing a company on the side. They've held on to their job and they've started thinking about starting a company on the side. So in our um, program, we actually have a name for this: bootstrapping with a paycheck. We we identified this phenomenon a long time back and started institutionalizing it, and we've built a lot of companies in this mode uh, where people do the validation in a kind of holding on to the job mode, and then once things are looking like, okay, this, can, this is going to go somewhere, that's when they quit their jobs. And I think uh, this phenomenon has accelerated in COVID. 
The uh, uh, kind of like an other side of coin phenomenon to this one is the rise of the solo entrepreneur. You know, the technology startup industry looks down upon solo entrepreneurs. We are big believers in solo entrepreneurs, especially couples with virtual companies. This is a, I think solo entrepreneurs is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, one of my favorite examples is the story of ServiceNow. Fred Luddy started ServiceNow as a solo entrepreneur. He just had a lot of domain knowledge and, and uh, he basically built a product by himself and, and two other people and started selling the product before any venture capital or anything. Eventually, of course, he went on to raise lots of venture capital and go the traditional route, but he is a solo entrepreneur. So we should be a bit careful about you know, vilifying solo entrepreneurs that you know, investors don't like solo entrepreneurs, that Y Combinator rejects solo entrepreneur, blah, blah, blah. Y Combinator should take into account the fact that you know, ServiceNow is a $100 billion plus company started by a solo entrepreneur. So, so my message actually to this audience of people who are kind of tinkering with entrepreneurship while you know, dealing with COVID from home is that don't get discouraged. Please continue down your path. And, and if you have specific domain knowledge with which to crack specific problems, you should be able to build companies. What do you think of this point of view? I love it with a capital L-O-V-E, two, two points on this. First, one, one of the things that has been benefit of work from home is you suddenly have a bunch of free time, right? So take yeah. your, uh, you know, I used to live in the Valley and I would, I would go 19 miles and it would take me an hour and 15 minutes um, yeah. for each, each way, right? So suddenly you have an hour of your commute each way or whatever it is, 20 minutes even, that's freed up. Yeah. Then think about, think about all the time in your day that I think has been freed up to pursue this. So, so that's my first point. Secondly, I've written a book about entrepreneurship. Just I'll make a shameless plug because all the proceeds go to charity, but it's called Mr. Monkey Me, A Real Survival Guide for Entrepreneurs. My biggest push for this is the world needs more entrepreneurs, the world needs more diversity in entrepreneurships, and it needs more mentally healthy entrepreneurs. So yeah. not just trying to plug the book, but what I talk about in it is it does not, so many people I meet think that you have to have the next Facebook or Starbucks or whatever, and they, and this voice in their head says, well, your idea isn't big enough. You know what? Every great business and service now is a great example, but even go to the, the venture fact funded businesses. A, you don't need venture capital to get going. If you can avoid venture capital and bootstrap your business, do it. You'll own more, you'll make more money, and you'll have more control. So I'm a big advocate of that. And two, my second point is don't, don't let the idea that your idea isn't big enough be the prevention from you getting going. Begin the begin. Start going. See where it goes. So I am, I'm so in line with what you said and so passionate about it, even though my day job is as a venture capitalist. I say to entrepreneurs all the time, if you can avoid working with people like me and get your business going and bootstrap it and own a bigger chunk of it, do that because, uh, you know, that's, that's the, that's 90% plus of all the, of the businesses in the world or more that aren't venture cap, venture capital back. Yeah. yeah. And VCs are looking to go from zero to hundred million in revenue in five to seven years. That's Hyper growth. Hyper growth is not natural state of business. Most companies don't grow exponentially. They grow linearly. They grow, you know, over time. You know, maybe it takes 20 years to build a 20 million dollar company. But as long as it's a sustainable, healthy company, and you're having a good time, you have a good set of employees and catering to good set of customers. That is a perfectly good success story. That's what we we constantly try to redefine success for people who are misled partly by the very bad work the media does of constantly pumping up funding news. It's, it's, this is why I wrote this book. And again, it's like, I wrote it because here's the content as an entrepreneur that you get, you either get like how to start, how to write a business plan, which is helpful, or you get what does Mark Zuckerberg eat for breakfast, which means nothing to the 99.99% .99 of entrepreneurs. It's a hard job. Yeah. You need support, but you're dead on. Let's let's run that math out, which is very anti venture capitalist. But let's say you you spend ten years or twenty years building a twenty million dollar business. You employed uh, some great folks and, and changed their livelihood. You had an impact on your community. You actually created real value for your customers. And oh, by the way, at some point, it's not all about money, obviously. But when you sell that business in X years 
and you own 100% of it or 95% of it, 90% you gave some of the employees, you've done incredibly well. And so I am so <laughs> online with this. And again, I don't want to, my day job is trying to, to build the business you described, but there is so many great opportunities to change your life, change the lives of others. It does not have to be all the nonsense that you see on Shark Tank or TechCrunch or what have you. So I'm 100% aligned with you. And I'm also very excited about the globalization of entrepreneurship phenomenon. There's a lot, you know, because of who we are and how we um, operate in this ecosystem, we see a lot of people coming to us from very, you know, small places. Like we had an entrepreneur come from a small town in uh, East Texas who's competing with Bill.com and has built a sizable business, bootstraps and everything, perfectly viable business, going gangbusters. And, and, you know, he came and he was like, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do. There is confusion because they are also reading this media fever about VC and, and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, you know, you're doing great. So don't, you know, don't change course. If you can stay the course and just keep doing what you're doing, that's great. We hear from small cities in India, you know, tier two, tier three cities in India. Um, and we have also started seeing a lot of deal flow and entrepreneurs coming here from Africa these days. We, um, one of the African magazines just put me on their cover. Um, and it's really heartwarming to see how much is going on around the world. Yeah, that's, that just warms my heart because I, I think you're dead on. I think that's the other benefit of some of the, not just COVID, but some of the technology and tools that are available to entrepreneurs now is that you can start a business from anywhere. You can access talent, the global talent base. You don't need yeah. to all be sitting in, in uh, SAC, uh, San Francisco. And again, you can, you can have such an impact. I mean, this is what I'm passionate about. You can pick up in my voice. This is what I'm passionate about encouraging people the, 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 my book is, the, the star of my book is, a, a, I call it Mr. Monkey. He was the voice in my head that said, you'll never be successful. You won't do it. And so the book yeah. is all about trying to give aspiring entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs the tools and the mental tools specifically to really take that first step. Because if you read the media and you think, gosh, I don't, I don't have an idea that's as big as Facebook. Oh, this isn't worth it. That's nonsense. Take the step, begin the journey and build to your point, build a great business with Five employees, no employees, whatever it is, you can change your life and others. It does not have, you don't have to get caught up in this. So I'm, I'm in the same page with you. And I love, I love that you're really carrying this flag because I think it's so important. Yeah. And to underscore what you just said, our definition of entrepreneurship equals is customers, revenues, and profits. Financing is optional. Exit is optional. So you can build you know, million, two million, five million, ten million dollar businesses, no problem, as long as you're staying fundamentals oriented. You can't play it both ways. You can't have outside capital and grow slowly. So you have, yep. if you want to grow slowly, you kind of have to do it bootstrapped. And there are some alternative means of financing. There's inventory financing available. There's different kinds of bank financing available as you start developing credibility. But um, but I think there are many more, you know, $5 million, $10 million ideas than this billion dollar, $2 billion, $10 billion ideas that you are, the media is bombarding us with constantly. So, uh, so your message and what you're trying to do with your book is absolutely, um, you know, in line with our message. But, you know, it's not easy to uh, convey this message because the, the counterpoint is, has such a megaphone. It really, it. it really does. And it is just the media world that we live in. But I think that's why when people ask me about books to read, um, I, I love Shoe Dog, for example, for those listening, which is the story of Nike and, and Phil Knight. Yeah. And the reason I recommend that book is just when you look at, it was 30 years, ups and downs, like great businesses. Yeah. A, you don't need venture capital. B, they take a long time to build. And but but see if you avoid the capital circle, which the media likes to talk about, you get this thing called ownership. And to your point, if you get revenue and profitability, and the third factor is ownership, I, I'm so frustrated by what gets missed in the media. Is someone has an idea, they get that blitz capital you talk about, they do build a billion dollar business, 
but at the end of it, they own a very small percentage of it because the capital came in and, and continued to take more ownership and put a bunch of terms that aren't invest entrepreneur friendly. So I'm speaking yeah. out of the other side of my mouth because my day job, I, I do I do try and give capital to entrepreneurs, but we don't play, as I said earlier, we don't play that game of of capital for capital growth at all costs. It doesn't make sense to me. Wonderful. Mike, thank you for uh, thank you for that message. It's it's it deeply welcome here in, in, on this forum. So I'm glad you're echoing some of the messages we have been trying to get out there. And I'm glad you wrote a book to reinforce that message. So thank you very much for coming today. Yeah, it's been great. It's always great to connect. I would I'm going to make my plug if you don't mind. Mr. Monkey and Me is oh. available on Amazon. All proceeds go to charity. They go to a scholarship set up for diverse and underrepresented upper upper underrepresented students interested in entrepreneurship. So if any of your listeners do buy the book, Mr. Monkey and me, it, all the proceeds go to help exactly what we're talking about. So there's my there's my shameless plug, but again, it's it's really for uh, for the charity I started around this. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mike. We'll Always a pleasure. Again. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. All right. Folks, uh, we are actually going to um, have a little bit of conversation. Um, we left this uh, roundtable relatively short because of my vaccination yesterday. Um, but I think we do need to have at least one conversation, right, Maureen? Jill, uh, Jill and Ricky, you are online. Hi, we're here. All right. Hello. Hi there. Hey. Good to see you. You want to? Are you? I guess you're not on video. <laughs> it's good to hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> Where are you dialing from? We are dialing from just outside of the Houston area. It's a little town called Friendswood in Texas. All right. Yeah. And what are you working on? So what we have been working on is called FitnessLocator.com. Um, it's, it's something we kind of started dabbling in about two years ago and started building on thinking about and uh, once COVID hit, that's kind of what prompted us to make it what it is now. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Ricky, if you want to tell her a little bit more about that. Okay, you guys can hear me, correct? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, as Jill was saying, uh, it started about two years ago um, and it's developed into a uh, listing platform and network kind of like a connection company for different businesses in the health and fitness industry throughout. Uh, so our platform is a searchable database that businesses can create a business profile on and consumers can visit our platform to search through our database of businesses by a reference location of a zip code and then a radius search. And along with that, they can also further their criteria on the search to things like amenities that they are looking for within a location, a goal specific activity that they have for their fitness journey. Um, and, and really the, the biggest part is just the amenities. Um, you can look for businesses such as dance facilities, gymnastic studios, gyms, nutrition shops, um, all space, all, all businesses within the health and fitness um, sector have a space on our platform. Okay. One, one easy way that we can explain it to a lot of people is by comparing it kind of to hotels.com. So although yeah. it's not a, book, a booking site like hotels.com in the same way, instead of going to Google to Google gyms near me and then it pulls up absolutely everything, just like it would if you Googled hotels near me. Um, like when you go to hotels.com, you can start off with the amenities, the area that you're looking for, the, the amenities that you're looking for in the hotel. And then from there, it narrows it down to exactly what, what fits your desires. Um, so that's kind of how we set up our databases to perform that same way to narrow it down. Um, for people specifically looking for, you know, what it is that they're looking for in a gym or in or nutrition. And what uh, you emailed me and said that you had some questions. You want to join the premium program. You have some questions. Could you please let me know what questions can I answer for you? So, um, babe, if you don't mind, I'm going to start on that one. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, so we've been looking at your program and uh, it does seem like it would be a good fit, but you know, some of our questions are. I think that we need um, this. This business has become so much bigger than we originally anticipated, and um, which is amazing. But you know, we're just a mom and a dad, and we 
are um, bootstrapping with a paycheck and we're raising four kids at the same time. So it's overwhelming sometimes. And I think we need help with structuring our business, um, yeah. getting a really good layout, having a really good plan for it, and also understanding whether we do need an investment or whether we really can continue to bootstrap this and coming yeah. up with a business plan that shows us we bootstrap it up until you know a certain point and then it opens up to where we can all that I guess is, really just all that is perfect we'll deal with all of that in the program so uh, i suggest you go ahead and join the premium program and then next week uh, you know we have weekly private roundtables for the premium members so schedule yourself okay. as soon as possible in the next premium round uh, private roundtable with Maureen and uh, and we will you know you can bring a presentation where you outline more of the fundamentals of the business where okay. you are you know etc so that I can have a look at it and uh, you know business model uh, go through the self-assessment and you will see the questions that we need to answer uh, mm -hmm. for me to get a grasp of that. But there are many ways of playing your hand. This, we were just discussing the virtual company question, right? Um, it bootstrapping with a paycheck is fine. You know, doing it in the, in the mode that you're doing it isn't fine. One of the ways that companies in the bootstrapping with a paycheck mode, where it's a solo entrepreneur, a couple entrepreneur, scale businesses is using virtual company mechanics very extensively so I can you know, guide you in that direction. So there are many ways of doing it. And, and if it makes sense to raise money, we can raise money, but we certainly do not force you to raise money or gratuitously steer you in that direction. Okay. Ricky, did you have anything to add to that? Did I miss anything on it? No, I, I think, I mean, I think that this probably goes without saying, I'm sure you've had many companies say what I'm about to say, but um, we've, our business, it really has developed insanely fast and there has been so many components that have come to light um, through development of it. And I think one of our biggest problems or not, not really problems, it's a good thing, but what we're struggling with kind of fitting into the plan is we have up to like five or six phases of our business right now that all implement different aspects of what we want this platform to hold. And one of our, one of our like struggles that we face is the order of um, of implementing these things and or if they would be better suited being implemented together so that's okay. kind of you know we'll prioritize those so that's exa those are exactly the kinds of things that we do in the premium program so perfect it's awesome. a good fit i think okay perfect. all right i'll see you next week at the premium round table great thank you so much yes thank you for your You're time welcome so folks, um, quick run through on how to use the premium program for those of you who haven't looked into it yet. Um, please go to the website, 1mby1m.com. Everything is there. You can start reading the blog. There's a lot of material there. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series, 12 volumes of case study-based books is also a good entry point into the methodology that we teach. Um, We've done over 525 roundtables. This is the 527th. Uh, so these roundtables are a great place for you to come whenever you want to. The full acceleration program is our premium program. So if you want to access the private roundtables for regular coaching, as well as our investor network, customer network, potential channel partners, media, et cetera, et cetera, the whole network effect, that would have to come through the premium program. Um, you could do the self-assessment and see how your business lines up against these questions. If you get stuck on knowledge gaps, do the bootstrapping course. I think you should do the bootstrapping course anyway. This is a free course that's pinned to the top of our blog. And then do one and by one and basic. That's a very good way to um, plug your knowledge gaps. So all these questions that are in the self-assessment are uh, answered with curriculum modules and sub modules and case studies within the curriculum. So you can really, you know, round out what you need to round out by way of knowledge on how to put one foot before the other. So go look at the website, what to expect from premium, what to expect from basic, FAQs, video FAQs, look at the curriculum description, uh, description and, uh, and see if this program is for you. We are a case study-based program. We have created a, 
an opportunity for you to stand on the shoulders of other people who have done it before. And that really is the, at the heart of this program. Um, if you're looking for our investor introduction policy, please go in and check the investor introduction section. It's, um, you know, just by joining the program, you don't get introduced to investors. You get introduced to investors if you're ready to be introduced to investors and you want to be introduced to investors. Our methodology on investors is bootstrap first, raise money later. You don't have to raise money, but if you want to raise money, you would have to validate first before you go out to raise money. That's it. We have pretty much roundtables every week, so I really, we look forward to seeing a lot more of you, uh, many more of you at these roundtables and working with you. These are safe working sessions, essentially. So if any of you have any further questions, please feel free to dial in or activate your computer audio. And if you have questions about the one and by one in program, Irina Patterson is a very good person to uh, talk to. She will, she's been with the program for a long time and knows pretty much everything about how the program runs. So questions, anybody? Any other, any other questions? Any introductions? Does anybody else want to introduce his or her venture? All right, no hands up. So I'm going to adjourn the session and uh, we will see you next time. Bye. Thanks for coming today.